Hi everyone, I'm Matthias Garate and we're going to start the third tutorial of our series about using Blender for astronomical visualization with data cubes. In this tutorial we are going to learn how to read astrophysical data file formats with Python scripting. We're going to see two really basic examples from a grid simulation and an SPH simulation. And we're also going to learn how to translate these these file formats into Blender voxel data formats. So we're going to use a lot of scripting. So I again recommend you to install your own Python package from scipy.org, for example. Instead of using the Blender default Python command line. So our first example is the grid simulation dataset. This was done by Sebastian Perez using the code Fargo 3D, developed by Pablo Benitez. And we can see a protoplanetary disk with a planet embed on it. And we can see in brighter colors the over densities of gas in the simulation. We can see that the closer we are to the center of the disk, the higher the density. And we can also study the perturbations made by this planet in, in the form of these spiral wakes. So these are called grid simulations because you subdivide a finite domain in a grid. This grid can be with any kind of coordinates. It can be a Cartesian grid, which is the most um, easy to understand examples, but it can also be a polar grid or an spherical grid. For example, here I'm showing, showing you a subdivided uh, cube that has um, three by three by three dimensions in each coordinate in the X, Y, and Z. So we're going to use this as an example. And in a grid simulation, what you do is to put an amount of gas in each of these cells. The gas has density, has temperature, has energy you record all those physical properties of the gas in each cell. And then you see how the how each cell of gas interacts with its neighbors. For example, if I have a lot of density in this side of the cube and too low density in this side of the cube, the gas will tend to diffuse through the cube until it is stable. If you have other forces like gravity, you will find more concentration in the, in the gravity closer to the gravity origin. So, now how do we write this into an astrophysical data file? You have, uh, you have the density, the energy, all the properties in the code. So, when you write it in a file, what you do is to take, for example, the density field, the density property, take the density that's in this upper cube, and write it into a file. Then you take the next cube and write it into the file, and so on until you fill all the until you write all the densities contained in this cube for the density field. It, the final file, if you write it into an an ASCII format, looks like this. It's a long column with all with zeros where there is no, no gas, when there is zero density, and is non-zero when there is some gas. So, the reason why there are empty cells is because in a, if you have a Cartesian subdivision and you have a disk, then it's obvious that you will have empty spaces in the in the borders. For example, in this region here that I'm pointing with my mouse, there is no gas in the Cartesian subdivision. But in so this region of the domain have to be empty with zero values. It has to be represented by zero values. Blender only accepts Cartesian subdivision, so that's why I'm using this as an example. Now, let's check how do we transform this 
kind of file format, this long column with the density values, into a Blender file format. So you can open the, the file vboxer underscore gridarray.py that's in the grid array folder in the GitHub repository. And we are seeing how this works line by line. So the first line is to run the script in from a Linux terminal. I'm not sure if this is mandatory for Windows, but I'm leaving it just in case. Oh, by the way, I'm using this Python shell that's called Idle. It comes installed when you download the package of Python from most of Python pages, but particularly from scipy.org. And it comes installed with the NumPy library included. So you can use it to open also Python files. So that was the first line. Now the second line is to import the NumPy library. So that means that now after this line, we can access to all the, the functions, all the functionalities contained in the NumPy library. It allows us to access a series of functions to, to work with large data sets. And these two words here as NP means that we are going to abbreviate our uh, this name with the NP letters, with the NP characters. So for example, at all the all the regions in the code that has the NP um, the NP characters means that we are accessing the properties of the NumPy library. We are going to see all of that in more detail in a minute. Now, the next section of the code is the user parameters. The user parameters are the, um, the values that you have to change in order to make everything work fine or to look fine in some cases. For this vboxer.gridarray.py file, the first parameters are the dimensions of the cube. So the nx, ny, and nz uh, variables are the number of times that we subdivide the cube. For example, in this example here, it will be as if I have um, if I have 400 subdivisions in the x-axis, I'm going to use 40 because to don't saturate Blender. 400 in the y and 50 in the in the in the set direction. So you can see that these are a lot of subdivisions and. Yeah, and I'm using this in this example 40 by 40 by 5. In this in the in the script we are using 400 by 400 by 50. So you, we have a lot of subdivisions to store our data set. Now, how what values should we put in this in these numbers? In the case of a grid array simulation, you cannot put just any value in those regions. At least not with not in the with the script that I'm using here. For this script, we have to put the precise dimensions of our data array. As I told you, each of these values, each of these lines represents one of these little of these small cubes. So the total amount of of lines in this file will be the nx, ny, and nz subdivisions of our original simulation. So you have to know the dimensions of your original simulation. And that's how you know how, what values to put here. Most astrophysical simulations comes with a, with a parameter file or a, an input file that has all this information. So now, for this example, I'm giving you the precise dimensions that are 400 by 400 by 50. Now, 
the next user parameter files are the name of our data file and the name of our output file. In the input, we are going to put between these double um, semicolons the name of our file where this long column is stored. In this case, our file is called gridarray.dat and we have to be in the same folder that we are running the script. Otherwise, you have to include the path to the to the to the file before putting the file name. For example, if I'm running the script in my desktop and my file and um, this data is in a folder called files, it should be and I should be putting here files slash gridarray.at. So, but in this example, I'm running the the Python script in the same folder that my data is contained. So that's why I only include the name. The output is practically the same, but I'm going to use this .bbox extension to distinguish my Blender voxel data file from the original dataset. No. Finally, I have included this, this flag here, this variable here, that's called log values. If you set these log values to true, that will make that all of our data is displayed in logarithmic scale. For example, if you have a va values, of, values of 1, 10, and 100 in three cells, when you, uh, when you set this flag to true, Instead of having 1, um, 10, and 100, you will have 0, 1, and 2, because we are applying the logarithmic with base 10 to all our values. And that will make our data look more smooth if there are two high gradients between two data, data sets, between two, two cubes in the voxel file. It's mostly for... Um, uh, visualization purposes. Sometimes astrophysical data files have a too wide range of scaling from, from a part in a million to thousands and there is no way you can distinguish that in a linear scale. So you have to use this logarithmic scale to distinguish them more clearly where is your low density regions and where are your high density regions. You can have a lot of orders of magnitudes in a astrophysical data file. In this case, I'm leaving as false, and that is, but that is because when I write my column data here, I already had applied the logarithmic scale. That's why I'm leaving this as false. Then the next part of the code is to read our data, to transform it into the Blender file format and to write our Blender file that. So this first line here may, means that we are going to ask to the NumPy library to load a txt a text file. And the text file will have the name contained in the variable input. So for example, I'm telling NumPy load the text file that's called grid array on dot dot. And store all my data in this variable called data, in this array called data. Now, this data variable represents this long column. All of this long column is contained in this single variable. And if we operate this variable with some with any mathematical function, it will operate all of our data. We don't have to go value by value, changing, making making sums, subtraction, divisions, logarithmics. When we apply a function to our data, it applies to all the column. For example, if log values, that means if log values is true, 
if this flag was true, it will apply a logarithmic with base 10 to all the data. This is not an equation. In, progr in programming, when you, when you say equal, that means you are assigned what's in the right side to the left side. So in this case, we are replacing the original data that, was, that is here. We are replacing it with the logarithmic base 10 of the data. And we are going to store again that value in our variable data. We are essentially replacing the original column with the logarithmic base 10 column. If this is set to true, if it's set to false, it will skip what is contained in after these, these two points. Now, the next part is to normalize our data. So that is that we do it with these two lines. First, we subtract the minimum value contained in data and we subtract it to our data. I'm going to do is this in the Python shell to make it more clear. The Python shell allows me to run the commands line by line and see, I can check the execution and the values stored in the variables in real time. If I run a script, I have to press run and it will run all the script at once. That's the difference between running a script and using the Python shell. The Python shell is this environment here. So, for example, if I initialize an array called a equal numpy array, I will use some example values, for example, 0 0.2, then 1.5, and 7.6. Now, I will subtract the minimum to this array to have my values set between zero and something. We are going to copy this line here, but changing a instead of data. So a will now be replaced by a minus the minimum value contained in our data, in our array a. So let's check how this work. Now a is 0, 1.3, 7.4. We subtracted the minimum value contained in our previous array a, that was 0.2, to all the values in the array. So 0.2 minus 0.2 is 0, 1.5 minus 0.2 is 1.3, and 7.6 minus 0.2 is 7.4. Now we have to set our values to be between 0 and 1. So for that, we are going to copy the scheme used here, data divided numpy maximum of data. So now a will be replaced by a divided the, num the maximum value contained in the previous array a. So a is now 0, 0 0.17 something, and 1.0. So we have re-escalated our values to have the same proportions, but now they are between 0 and 1. We're going to continue analyzing our script. Finally, the only things we left to do is to write the header. This is the instruction for Blender to know how many subdivisions it has to make in the data cube to tell, to tell Blender that it has to make an X, an Y, and an Z subdivisions. This one number is related to the still frame number that's in the voxel data panel options. 
so leave it to one it will work and we are telling it to convert this array as to a numpy array when we convert something to a numpy array it allows us to use a numpy array properties like changing the type of the array we are going to see that right now so the next line opens the binary file my it says that open a file that will be called what's contained on the output variable that's grid array dot bbox and write it as binary this wb i suppose it is for write binary next we are telling the header that has all of our dimensions to be cast as integer of 32 bits this is the word parenthesis here we are telling our head you will act as a 32 bit integer and write yourself into the binary file so now our header has been written into the binary file next we are telling the same to the data but we are telling the data act as a floating point numbers of 32 bits and write yourselves into the binary file this parenthesis of with with this symbol here i4 and f4 means to write yourself as 32 bit act as 32 bit and that is because blender reads from 32 bits to 32 bits and finally we are telling the the bin file to close that will update all our changes into the file so once we run the script it will generate the vvoxel file that we can load into blender so we have our cube selected you can load the grid array dot vbox file into into the blender environment and that's it that's how you re you read a simple grid array file now i'm going to check another file format that's the sph with this with the simulation of jorge quadra using gadget 2. so the sph is the um, is the acronym for smooth particle hydrodynamics and in difference with the grid array simulations the smooth particle hydrodynamics simulation what it does is to set a number of particles for example i will represent with these vertex points here and each particle will represent um, will represent an amount of mass with a given density energy temperature and all those properties but it can have any position in the 3d environment it doesn't have to to be in a in a fixed grid they can be in any in any position and they will interact with with a finite number of closest particles and that will and the equations will tell how the densities temperature energies velocities have to change so now the question is how do we convert this format that has the position and properties of the particles into a blender voxel fire that is a subdivided cube so an sph format can be written in many ways but we are going to use this table format for example in this table you can see the each line represents a particle and is each column the first column represents the x position of the particle the second the y position of the particle and the third the z position of the particle and the last value the last column represents the the physical a physical value of the particle in this case the density so now we have to convert this into a data cube for blender so to do that i'll open the bvoxer underscore sph script that is in the sph folder in the github the first two lines are the same but now with the for the resolution we can pick anything we want 
you only have to worry that it is not um, to high resolution because that Blender and your computer have a limit of how much memory they can visualize and, and treat at once. So take care with that, only with that point. Now, the, again, this is the number of subdivisions of the cube. Then the same as before, the input and output um, names of our file. In this case, the our our dataset is stored in the sph.dat file. So we are saving. So we are saving that value in the input variable, and we want our output value, our output file, to be called sph.dbox. And we will store that in the output panel here, in the output variable here. Then the same as before, if you want your density values to be in the in a logarithmic scale, you have to uh, to set this to true. And now the last thing you have to take care of is the minimum and maximum values of the domain. So as I told you before, these particles have a have a position in x, y, and z. So we are going to we are going to make this. I'm going to make a representation of what we are going to do. So we are going to have this cube. So we are going to have this cube, and we are going to say where our particles are located inside the cube that we want to visualize in Blender. So to do that, we have to know what are the, what is the minimum x and maximum x possible values of our particles to set, to make the transformation from the simulation uh, coordinates to the new Blender cube coordinates. So, for example, in in this simulation, I know that the minimum values of the simulation domain were zero for each of the coordinates and the maximum were five. But I can play with that until to be to optimize my data cube to have less empty values. For example, this SPH simulation is not optimized in in my transformation. And that is because, for example, I'm going to put my cursor here. And you can see that I have a lot of empty space in the cube uh, to the to the left side of the cube, and most of my particles are focused to the right. That is because in the original simulation I have more stuff in this in this side of the cube, more gas in this side of the cube that I did not want to plot in the final result. So again, to find those values, you have to know the parameter file of the simulation, but again, I'm giving you the, the real values for the simulation example that are 0 and 5. But if you don't want to, to find those values by yourself and you don't want to go by trial and error, you can set this variable here, the auto min, auto min max, to true, and that will make the code, the following lines, to automatically find what are the minimum and maximum values of our particles in the simulation. And that will set you a scale. You will then have to play with the Blender scale of the cube to make it look right, because it might not be as evenly spaced as it was supposed to be in the simulation. Now we go to the code. Again, we are going to load to ask the NumPy library to load our file. But in this case, instead of store everything in one single array, we're going to store it in four. And that is because we have four columns. Now we have to tell the numpy load text file the input name of our file that is stored in this input variable here, sph.at. And we are going to use these two um, flags here 
to unpack the columns and use the columns from 0 to 3. In programming, the first column has the index 0, the following the index 1, then the index 2, and then the index 3. You will your indexes always go from 0 to the maximum minus 1. And that is a programming convention. It's, it's like that in most programming languages. If the auto min max flag was set to true, it will calculate the minimum and maximum values in the x, y, and z coordinates. And we'll use that to set our scale to be contained within our data cube. Our data cube has nx, ny, and nz dimensions. We want all of our particles to have positions between 0 and nx, ny, and nz to be contained within the cube. For that, we first subtract the minimum for each of our coordinate values, and then we divide by the difference between the minimum and the maximum. And after that, we multiply by the total dimension of our cube. It's essentially the same we did before for setting the values between 0 and 1, but now we are setting our values to be between 0 and nx, ny, and nz. So now all of our particles have a coordinate x, y, and z that's contained within our data cube coordinates. Finally, as our cube is discrete, it has only integer positions, it has discrete positions, we're going to set everything to be integers. First, our values could be were floating points numbers, decimals, but now they'll be uh, integer numbers. Next, if we set the log value variable to be true, it will make our data to be in logarithmic scale. And after that, we have to fill our data cube. Now we have all particles to be to have dimensions within our data cube, but we, but we still have not filled our data cube. We count how many particles they are, so we ask the data for its size. We say, we say what is the size of our data set? How many particles we have? Then we create our data cube that will be called vData for voxel data. And we say that our data cube will, will be an array of nx by ny by nz dimensions filled with zeros at the beginning. And we have this other array that will have the same dimensions of our voxel data and will also be initialized with zero. And in this array, we will count how many particles are in each cell, in each data cell. Next, for each particle, we ask the particle for the x, y, and z position that it has. And we are saying that in that position, in our data cube, we are going to add the density value contained in for that particle, for the particle with index i. Finally, we are using the point count array to say that in that grid cell, given by the coordinates x, y, and z, we have one more particle. For example, if we have in this, in this example here, we can have a lot, five particles in this region and zero particles in this region. But as we are adding the density of each one, at the end of this loop, we want to take the average for each cell by number of particles. Now we set the point count. If the point count were less than one for one cell, for some cell, set it to one. That is because we don't want to, to divide by zeros if there were no particles in a certain cell. Now, finally, we divide our data that we filled with these data values in this in this line, 
we are going to divide each cell by the amount of particles that are in each cell. And that normalization will, will give us values to be an average value. And finally, in this last line here, we normalize our data as before to be between 0 and 1. Then we write the header, and if we run the command, it will generate this Blender voxel file that we can see here. That is one way to make an SPH, astrophysical simulation, to transform it to a data cube. There are other techniques for SPH simulations, like plotting them with halo points, as I'm as I'm going to show you here. But the, the final result won't look as smooth as, as if you had one single data cube. So you can see that if all of these were SPH particles, if this was an astrophysical simulation, we, we would see the spaces between one particle and the other. Even if we have um, thousands of particles, we could still see the gaps between. That is why I prefer to render an SPH simulation using a data cube instead of, um, of individual particles. That's the, that concludes our third tutorial series. I hope you liked it. And now everything that's left to do is to check some advanced topics. We are going to see in the following tutorial how to transform a more complex grid into a Blender voxel file. We're also going to see how to use the compositor to add a starry background to the, to the image. And we are also going to learn how to change uh, voxel files in Blender by script to make a full animation of our simulation dataset. That's it. See you next time. Bye bye.